And one trick. Zoning Board of Review is now in session. Uh, first item of business is roll call. Uh, Dr. Donovan. Here. Ms. Horwitz. Present. Mr. Lorenzo. 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 Present. And uh, Acting Chairman Ben Farrell is present. Uh, we have no chairmen's messages or anything like that, so we'll get right down to new business. First item on the agenda is Dan Abaddon and Ruth Wong for property located at 82 Glen Road, Assessor's Map 58, Lot 46. Uh, the applicant seeks a dimensional variance for a second curb cut onto a street in a traffic sensitive overlay district. Is either uh, Mr. Abaddon or Ruth Wong? Please come forward and let's make sure the microphone there is turned on. Testing. Thank Perfect. You. Sir, if you could give your full name and address to the secretary. Hi, Daniel Abaddon, 82 Glen Road, Fort Smith, Rhode Island, 02871. And you promise to tell the truth? I do. Perfect. Tell us what you'd like to do. Yeah, so we have an existing driveway. I think you have the document in front of you from the PDF that we that we gave. So we would just like to, I yeah, as you said, put another curb cut to kind of make um a semicircle, more like a quarter of a circle, so that we can kind of have cars swing out front ways. And you know, we just have a busy family, a busy household, and we'd like to have that enhancement to our current driveway. And we would use pavers, like porous pavers, so that it shouldn't, or it would look good, but it should impact the potential on the runoff, I guess, too, potentially. Mm -hmm. So that's the gist of it. Um, and as we kind of detailed in there, we're bound by um, an additional dwelling unit that houses my in-laws behind it. It's kind of a renovated barn, Our, a property line to the I guess that would be west of it and then our house. So we can't put we can't put like a turnaround pad in the back. That that's what a lot of our neighbors have to enable like a front end pull out. And you know, this this improvement is important to our family because we have, I have three daughters, like one's driving age, the others will be. And also because of my elderly in-laws, we have a um, you know, nurses coming in and out of our driveway as well. So it would really enhance we think definitely our quality of life but also we think the safety of having back out and you know we've been parking on the lawn a lot and doing different things like that so we thought this would be in the zoning parlance i guess the least the least necessary or how, however you guys put that um and you know we went to our neighbors and i think one of them wrote a letter in here that our direct neighbor across the street and you know, they, they all seem okay with it. And I, you know, I, I have a background in civil engineering and I do think it could actually enhance the safety of the whole road for the whole community because it would create less traffic friction from our unit, our home. So that's kind of the gist of it. Cool. Thank you. Uh, um, um, I just wanted to make a comment that, that this property, Glen Road is considered a high traffic overlay and specific regulations to that there's a um, Article Three, Section G, that uh, um, uh, item two in that list is driveways shall be shall have suitable turnaround space so that automobiles do not have to back out onto the street. Yeah. And and so that's what this would help. And then and then contradicting that, item three, three A is there's only going to you you're only allowed to have one curb cut. Um, uh, in, and that's put in as a mitigation against increased traffic on the road. Mm -hmm. So that may not be applicable here because it's it's just one home and they're gonna have that many cars on the property, whether they're backing out or going forward. So I've got, I, I, just by coincidence, I've just done a application for a curb cut in another municipality. So do, and this is really a question for Aaron, does this need to be reviewed by public works? Because I know there's, and I don't know in Boston, in Portsmouth, I don't know if there's a regulation of the distance between the two curb cuts. So this was initiated by public works. 
So they sent it to us. Yes. So they they caught they 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 caught it and they said they said you need a, a variance for this from the planning board or zoning board, um, and they're the ones that said to stop work and to go to the zoning board to get that. But they were okay with the distance between the two. Yeah. Because we 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 not, we couldn't judge that. Yeah. It, so the, the, it came from Public Works. Okay. Um, and they said you need a, a variance to get that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Raposa has joined the uh, zoning board now. Apologize, I, my no tardiness. Do any do any board members have any other questions? I, I yes, I guess I do. So, in terms of having been told to stop the work, you have white stone in the location where it's going to be at this point, right? Correct. There's construction material on top of it. And what's the? It's like a dirt road off to the side before the uh, garden and the arborvitaes there. Yeah, that's uh, my understanding is that's the farm's property who who owns that. Are you talking across the street from our property? No, no, no. right on the side of it, right on the side of the house. Oh, that that's just dirt that was taken up from um um the construction work that had started there. It's not a dirt road or anything. It's not. It's just grass got torn up during the vehicles coming and going. Um, Fair so. Enough. We're using it. Yeah, we do pull our cars in that section of the yard right now. And and this this new driveway would hopefully like eliminate the need for that. Um, but yeah, that's probably and, and we're also having the house painted. So if you've gone by our property now, there are like a, a ton of stuff going on in the front lawn. But the idea is to to have this and then down the road, that would be that would be the only place the cars would be. And we wouldn't have to put the cars on the lawn anymore. So. Okay. That's the gist of it. Okay, and Mr. Kelly has joined the the board at this time. Uh, does that are there any other questions from the board? Um, I have a a letter from uh, um, Theodore and Hillary Peets, eight five Glen Road. Um, dear Chairman Knott, as the Butters, we write this letter in full support of the filed petition for relief by Dan Abaddon and Ruth Wong of eight two Glen Road pertaining to section G, traffic sensitive overlay district at your next regularly scheduled meeting, November 16th, 2023. The proposed addition to their driveway will decrease the likelihood of vehicles needing to back on the Glen Road, vastly increasing motorist safety for neighbors and through vehicles. Respectfully submitted, Theodore Peets and Hillary Peets. Um, are there any abutters or interested parties in the audience who'd like to speak on this subject? That's a no. Aaron, is there anyone online who'd like to speak? No. So Aaron, to, to, to vote on this item, um, should we go with Dr. Donovan Mr. Lorenzo, Ms. Horitz, and myself, given that we heard the entire um, petition. Very good. So so that'll be the voting for, and then and then Mr. Raposa and Mr. Kelly will will hold off on this one. Yes. Dr. Donovan, would you like to yep. carry I'm gonna vote to approve the uh, dimensional variance. I think it makes a lot of sense that it would be safer to, you know, to do that. You had also um, in the application, there were also pictures of other locations on Glen Road that had a similar type of uh, situation. Um, it's going to be safer for everybody in Glen Road, as far as I can see. Thank you, so, Mr. Lorenzo. I agree for the same reasons. Ms. Horitz? Yeah, I vote to approve for reasons previously stated. Um, uh, I also vote to approve this. Uh, this request for dimensional variance. Um, going through the, the dimensional variance criteria in our ordinance, um, uh, there, there is no reasonable alternative to, to improve the back out situation on this property. The, the hardship, basically the position of the driveway um, is due to a unique characteristic of the property and is not the result of any prior action um, of the applicant. Granting this variance does not alter the characteristics of the surrounding area. And as um, noted, this is the least relief necessary. So, sir, you're approved. Thank you.
You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have uh, Robert Furlan, property located at 330 Riverside Street, tax assessors map 15, lot 71. The applicant seeks dimensional variances to construct a single family home. That's correct. Would wow. you Bob Furlan currently at 148 Power Street, Portsmouth? And you promised to tell the truth? Yes. All right. Please tell us what you'd like to do. Uh, just, I've owned a lot. Um, approximately 20 years since I owned uh, 333 across the street. I sold 333 about a year ago with the intention of eventually building a new house across the street. So that gave me the, the funding to do so. So I've been in the, the plans um, uh, with John, who's been represent, representing Westchester Homes for a modular home there. And we've, as far as I know, gone through all the processes to get everything approved and um, you know, just need to get your approval. Great. And 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 my understanding is is the home, the the frontage of the home is about twenty two feet wide. Yep. And the lot is about twenty four feet wide. Uh, roughly thirty. Of oh, thirty yeah, feet it's wide. Got thirty by about a hundred back. Yeah. So the proposed building is twenty two by twenty four deep. Yeah. Two levels. Um, uh, pier foundation to get it up above the flood zone. Driveway, uh, garage, small driveway in front. So, so in this case, we're looking. You're you're looking for a a um, special use from permit for a substandard lot of record, a and some dimensional variances. The a dimensional variance on the front, where twenty feet is required, not fourteen feet is planned. So they need a six percent, or I'm sorry, a six foot variance on the front. There is no variance required or requested on the rear. And the east side of the building, 10 feet is required, four is planned. So that's a, a variance of six feet. On the west side, again, 10 feet is required, four feet is planned, and a variance requested of six feet. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's not a special use permit. You're there, uh, anybody's allowed to build um, on a substandard lot. Um, ah, okay, okay. It's just a dimensional variance. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Does anyone on the, does anyone on the board have any questions? Uh, just just one. You have an approved septic system. Yes. Through uh, Mount Hope Engineering. Okay, so it's completely approved. Yeah, and it's going to be in the back of the house. Okay. Kind of why the house needs to be a little more forward than typical. Um, Aaron, do we need to go through the uh, A through J criteria? No, because it's not a, a special use permit. It's just uh, okay. dimensional variances. How about dimensional variances on a substandard lot would be the one that you'd uh, go through. Let me see where I... So would that be um, Article Six, I you know four A through four D, four A through four E? Yes. Yeah. So 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 I just need to ask you a few questions. Sure. I'm sorry if I'm stumbling through this. This is my first time. <laughs> no problem. Running this meeting. You're doing my, a good job. <laughs> my first time here as well. So. <laughs> so 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 there are about four questions that, that we need you to answer, okay. uh, uh, will this allow adequate light? I, I'm sorry, will this allow adequate space for fire protection? Yes. Uh, does this provide adequate light and air between buildings? Yes. Um, does this alter the character or adversely affect neighboring properties? No. And does this result in lot coverages or setbacks less than the average in the neighborhood? I, I would think that answer would be yes, right? Because we're that's what I need to get approved. Is that correct? Uh well 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 if, if 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 for example your building is set back approximately the same as your neighbors, then there's right. no um uh a lot or setback issue. Okay. And and if 
if, if the neighborhood is also composed of you know houses on relatively small lots, then you know it's certainly possible that that the um, uh, setbacks in lot coverage are not out of line with the rest of the neighborhood. Okay. And I figured what I had, you know, Mount Hope Engineering do the plan, to yeah. look at the lot and see where the house could be situated as to where the septic could be put. I, yeah. I assume yeah. that was the best. And then, this, and then does this um, impose a substantial detriment to the public or immediate neighbors? No. Very good. Um, I have no, so no questions from the board? I I have just something to, and I don't know if it's an issue, but I think there's a minimum distance you can have windows to a property line. I think it's a building code issue, so it's not a, just check that, because okay. otherwise you have to fire rate those. And I don't know if it's two feet or five feet, that's what I'm not sure of, but I would okay. check into that. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any abutters or interested parties in the audience who'd like to speak on this? Sure. Ma'am? Hello, could you please give your name and address? It's Susan Panaggio, 324 Riverside Street. Uh, and if you could pull the microphone down a little more, we'll be able to hear you better. That better? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm right next door to this lot. I've been there for almost 40 years. There's never been anything there. There was a shed there once, it blew to pieces in a hurricane. There was a vegetable garden there once. Um, I just had to come and say, no, I'm I'm not pleased with this. It's gonna be right at my back door. It's gonna be right there. And I just had to say it. <laughs> no what else to say. Okay. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Any other abutters or interested parties? Hi, good evening. Please give your name. Ashley Beecher, 268 Riverside Street. Uh, Andrew Pimentel, 268 Riverside Street. We live in a very dense neighborhood. The houses are already on top of each other. This is the last piece of property that doesn't have a house. And it's what, can you tell me the square footage of this property? Uh, on, the, on the applications, 3,061 feet. Hmm, it's a lot larger than I was told. Okay, so um, the gentleman who wants to build here owned a hotel across the street at 333. He used his residence as an Airbnb. And then he sold it, and he told many people that he was interested in building another Airbnb on this property, that he would live there maybe a year, do another Airbnb, and then sell the property and move south. We currently have 11 Airbnbs operating in our densely populated neighborhood. We don't need 12. And the property is extremely small. I don't know if you've seen it. Yes, I have. Yes. How do you build on something so small without encroaching upon your neighbor's peace and privacy? Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say. And sir, it would be uh, uh, totally out of character with the uh, rest of the properties. Uh, no other houses are on stilts there uh, because they're all built before those those uh, rules. And uh, this is <clears throat> going to be sticking out like a sore thumb because it's going to be uh, on stilts. It'll be three stories and uh, it's just going to look hideous and it'll block a lot of views. It's going to block my view. And uh I don't know if he's planning on cutting down trees in this plot. He's got some big, beautiful trees that provide shade for many of the houses around. And it just it's just too small a lot. It's just it's just going to be totally out of place. And it's a residential neighborhood, and he's planning on turning it into a business. And that just that's just not right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And and one more thing, if the trees are taken down, which would be three beautiful maple trees. When there's a nor'easter or a, a storm that comes through, these trees help to protect the neighborhood and the homes. With these three trees that are gonna be taken down, it's gonna be just wide open for the wind to come through. Uh, so it's there's nothing positive to say. Very Thank good. you for your time. Thank you. Address? 
Oh, no, 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 sir. My name's Peter Latender, and I own a uh, Quonset hut. Sorry, your address, please. I don't know it. You don't know your address? No, it's a rental property for us. It's a Quonset hut. We're abutting him on, I believe, the east side. Okay, so. 73. Lot 73. Lot 73, I can go like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Sorry. 346 so I, Riverside. I do have a I do have a tenant there. Um, and he, he's a really good tenant for us for many years. Um, we keep the property specifically for him. When it's when he moves out, that's something my family is going to use uh to build a house on in accordance with the standards. That whatever the uh we'll we'll live within we have a one bedroom septic, we'll live with we'll live with a small house. I think to build a house four feet on the property lines is just it's too tight. That whole neighborhood is very tight now, and that's even tighter than most of the houses that are on there now. And I think it's just it's not adding any anything good to to the area. That's my opinion. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, no, sir, you, you've already had an opportunity to speak. Uh, um, if I could bring out some points relative to the uh, butter comments, um, uh, views in Portsmouth are not protected. So if someone is going to build a, it's going to modify or put up property and it adversely impacts someone's views, that's not something that the board can take into consideration. Another thing that the board is prohibited from doing is depriving someone of of, of <clears throat> complete use of their property. So, so telling this applicant that you could never build a house there because we don't like it, you know, we want it to be an empty lot the way it's always been, um, is also something that the that the uh, um, that the board should not consider. And uh, from uh, from a from a a um, um, just an observation point of view. Although the although the applicant may in the future or now intend on on using this property as an Airbnb, I, I would suggest that 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 any of the neighbors, even though they may not want to rent rent the property now or have an intention of renting it now, their situation could change tomorrow, and it would be they probably wouldn't want the town to say no, you can't use your property that you pay taxes on the way in a legally, um, in a legal way. Um, so. Can I, uh, oh, yeah. yes, ma'am. Yeah. Can I ask you on the survey, it looks like this property was subdivided. Would, would you like to come forward, sir? I, I, I don't know, but when I look at it, it looks to me like it. it uh, well, it looks here like there were two that matches the one behind. When was this subdivided? Uh, I, I don't know. So, was, so that wasn't, you didn't subdivide no. it. I know, I know. But, but so, uh, so I was just asking, you didn't subdivide this no. lot. Anyone else on the board have any other questions? I have one other question. Sorry. Sure. Um, you've raised is this in a flood zone or not? Yes. Is that why you've raised the first floor? That's and it's not uh pilings, as the gentleman said, it's actually a, a full foundation, um, concrete foundation. So it'll be fully enclosed, you know, out of a garage. So what flood zone are you in? No, what flood zone are we in? Um, I'm not sure of the flood zone number. I mean, I was across the street up for 20 years in 333 Riverside Street. So I'm assuming it's the same flood zone right there. And the design we did was to purposely bring it up and go to the, I think the height restriction is 35 feet, I believe. And I think we're up to yes. about that with the foundation and two floors and the roof. It's a flood zone AE, Susan. Sue. 
the flood zone is AE. Okay, thank you. Let's go to the AE. So what elevation do you have to be to be out of the flood zone? 15 feet? 12, John? Nine. Nine. I, I don't know from the exact plans. It just saves me money. <laughs> Insurance. Mm -hmm. So if it's nine, why is it a 21 nine per first floor? Elevation. Yeah. Sea level. Yeah, sea level, yeah. I think. Flooding is 15 feet, right? 15 well, it varies. Depends on the area where it yeah. is. So if I'll, it's an E yeah. 12. I, all I can say is I you know, I had Mount Hope Engineering do the whole plan. So I, it's not something I know. I'm assuming they did that based on all what right. they. Look, the topo says it's 13 feet around where the foundation is. Okay. And it slopes to the road. Okay. I, yeah, I don't know how to answer that. Okay. I just trust my engineering people that did the, the plan for me, which I'm, I'm was approved by whoever needed to approve that. And whether that's is that DEM John or is that anybody else? John's my builder. Okay, you guys know him. Probably they said elevation off the benchmark is about three hundred eight feet. Yeah. And then you get the one of bottom. I think you said it's a new point. It's approved by, I would assume, the DM, CRMC, you know, approvals are here. It's that with the kind of hone in on the dimensional there. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Because the overall elevation is less than 35 feet anyway than the existing grade. Yeah, that's a different. Yes. But it isn't that different. It's a requirement. Yeah, it's required. Yeah. I'll push the Any other questions from the board? None. Uh, uh, for this one, we'll have Mr. Kelly, Dr. Donovan, Ms. Horitz, Mr. Raposa, and myself. And Mr. Raposa, can you vote first? Sure. Uh, <laughs> Yep. About 330, uh, Riverside Street, Portland, Island, uh, tax assessor, Matt, 1571. Uh, speaking a dimensional variance. Sorry. Oh, sorry. You can start again. Like public speaking. <clears throat> we have Robert Fury in here, uh, 330 Riverside Street, Portsmouth. Um, Lot uh, map 15, lot 71, um, seeking to build a new home, a two bedroom, two bathroom, elevated residence, uh, seeking three uh, dimensional variances. Um, in there, yes, front, east, and west. Front, east, the uh, front, east, and west of six, six feet all around, right? Correct? Y yes, sir. Yes. Um, so this will start it off. Uh, I approve all six. I think it's it's reasonable within the neighbor the confines of the neighborhood. I think a lot of houses in the same area are less than maybe four, two feet, and I've been down there many times every day. Actually, um, not that street, but uh, again, it's definitely different for the neighborhood. But it is in keeping. It's it's mandated by you know also resources DEM the. Uh, you know the confines of how it's got to be constructed so um, I, I approve all three and you know wish you luck i feel bad i mean i know it's upset in the neighborhood but it's kind of out of our control so i mean we, we can't really take you trees what they do with it that's kind of out of our jurisdiction we're 
we're focused yeah. on dimensional variance here. If you, if you would like to me to speak to the trees, I did have a couple of tree experts come and they said they, those trees should probably be taken down because they might come down in a potential storm. So I wouldn't take them down if I didn't have to. One hangs right over the property, which I would have to anyway, but the one in the rear of the property, the, the tree expert said that that one could potentially come down and then it might land on someone's house. So yeah. I felt I was doing a good thing there. That's all. Yeah, I mean, I, I assume if it was a nice tree and it worked with the use of the property, you'd probably believe yeah. it. But if it's going to be a detriment or a hazard, you probably won't. And, and I, I know nothing, that. Right. And I know nothing about trees. I relied on what the tree expert told me. Yeah. yeah. And they're, again, they're on Peter's property. They're not even on mine, but I'll have to take them down. So I, I just, I can't make my decision based on that, but I, I approve it for what I have in front of me here. So thank you. Good luck. Ms. Horitz. So uh, can I have one more question? Oh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. I have you included the porch in your lot coverage? The front porch off the first, I believe that is included in the lot coverage, John. Yes. Okay. Well, what I, there are no dimensions and the um, 24 by 22 is 528 and you said it's 600 it's less than 600 if 600 you'd need a lot coverage so what is the size of the porch the porch is 72 it's okay I'm, it's, well, I'm going to abstain from this. I think there's information here that's not complete. I I have a problem. I know they're not requesting a lot of coverage, um, but in a sense, they could have gone longer. And I know there's a septic issue, I but I think there were options of maybe increasing the side yard setbacks than what was done. So I'm going to abstain from voting on this. Okay. Mr. Kelly? Fortunately, it's kind of out of our hands. So for reasons previously stated, I'll vote to approve. Dr. Donovan? Um, I'm going to regrettably, I think, vote to approve to it. doesn't really seem entirely to me like it's in character with the neighborhood um with the size uh and everything but it, i also hate to um not allow for somebody to use their property i also vote to approve the uh the home while taller than some homes in the neighborhood uh, uh this is a a kind of a, a, a modern newer building approach to raise homes above to raise living area higher given the floodplain and flood potential. And as with Dr. Donovan, I certainly believe that uh, um, property owners should be allowed to use their property and not just pay taxes on it and leave it empty. So I approve. And that means we have one, two, three, one, two, three, four, four votes to approve. Uh, sir, your, your application is approved. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Can you tell me what this can be 72? This is 22, so 76 is 25. Next is uh, Mr. Marcos Car Carapia, property located at 40 Cul de Sac Way. Thank you. Um, map 35, lot 6 Baker. Applicant seeks a dimensional variance for retroactive approval to locate a container shed over 120 square feet located in the front, rear, and side yard setbacks. Yes, sir. Could you please give your Hi. name and uh, address? Marcus Carapia, 40 cul de sac way, Portsmouth. And do you promise to tell the truth? Yes. Yes, sir. Please tell us what you'd like to do. All right. So uh, I bought the container. I didn't know I need to ask for a variance. I'm a new at uh, being a homeowner. And uh, my, pers my purpose for choose the the containers as a shed, so I can use to store my uh, uh, pool stuff on it. I also uh, self-employed painter, 
that I have letters, uh, have other equipment as a painter. So I also would like to store uh, inside of the shed as well. Um, I've been having some problem with a flood in my basement. So a lot of this stuff is being getting mildew because I need to save some money to do the French drain. So it's pretty expensive to do that. And uh, so I, I thought it was a good idea to buy a container because the container cost me $2,000 instead of a shed. That's like eight grand and a French drain is already $14,000 uh, to have it done. So that's uh, is the reason that I bought the shed, uh, the container. And my plan is to have this container for a year and a half and a couple of years so I can have uh, the French drain and uh, be able to afford to build a, a nice shed on my backyard if I'll be allowed to, because I don't know the regulation about size of sheds. Um, so that's my... Our, 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 our regulation is that you are able to have a shed of 120 square feet without permission, okay. you know, provided it's it's set back a little bit from the, the side yards. So I think in your container is about two and a half times that, yeah. uh, like 320 square feet yeah, or so. It's eight by 40. Uh, yeah, that's on the back corner of the house. And, and, and your intent is to remove this container within a couple of years? That's my idea, to sell it. And uh, and this time I save some money and I build a, a shed, maybe bigger than, mm -hmm. but I'll have to ask for uh, the variance again to build up something nice on a property. Mr. Lindo, would it be reasonable to include a um, a uh, condition that the that the uh, um, shipping container can only be on the property for two and a half years? You can impose a condition like that. Yeah, sure. Okay. Does anyone on the board have any questions? Do you have a garage now or no? I do have a garage. What's in the garage now? Uh, I'm planning to keep my cars in the garage. I have two cars. Okay. I mean, I I wouldn't want to be living next to a shipping container for two and a half years myself. I mean, I, I think right now the way the property is configured, if I'm not if, if I'm correct. The, the 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 shipping container next to your property is a wooded lot yeah it's uh it looks like a abandoned farm on the right side and the back is also a cemetery that's being uh it looks like it hasn't been cared yeah yeah Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. you think it's what so like what is really necessary like maybe it's what we would kind of Way in on this. Yeah. So we could look at this as a temporary major measure because. But, um, but why? He's got a garage. He could take his cars out for his stuff. And go ah, but and he also has a basement, but the basement is filling with water. The cars would be upset. Mm -hmm. How zoning regulations that would protect property values of neighbors? Zoning regulations. I don't know if there are any neighbors here. Correct. That's that's that, that, that want to weigh into mm -hmm. where the effect mm -hmm. of living next door to a shipping mm -hmm. Well, we ask, we ask, we ask for yeah, 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 yeah. And that's certainly a, a, a decision that you can arrive at also. That is this a detriment to the neighborhood, given that it's a residential neighborhood, with the proposal to have a you know, industrial um, shipping container on it. Yeah, and also would be willing to plant. Uh, small trees around just so don't bother the neighbor view. As I, I heard that the view of the neighbor is not what taken consideration, but I would love to make sure uh, I wouldn't bother the neighbor's view. I already painted a green, was orange. I painted them green uh, to kind of fade in. I would do other things to make invisible as possible. Um, as a painter, I can do some to make it better. Are there any other questions from the board? Not really questions or comments. I've seen it, and I have to say, with you know, I was expecting to see this bright silver thing, and it is pretty unobtrusive in terms of how it is painted and where it's located. It is located very much at one end of the uh, of the property. 
um, most of the neighbors probably couldn't see it, except for the place, the people in the um, apartments yeah. or whatever that are in the back of it, right there. Um, Quaker Quaker Manor, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. They're right in the back of the uh, property too. So, is so anyone it, here from any, any neighbors yeah. represented here? I have a Miss Melissa over here. Ah, okay. So, so, so there's a there, there's a home across the street. There's a there there's a wooded lot, yeah. um, to the to the you know to one side, and then there's a, a, a empty gap, and then the uh, the apartments to the south. So which where where is the where are you proposing to right over there? It's there already. Oh. What what again is in it? What's that? What is in the container? Sorry, in the container. Uh it's on the back. What what is inside there? Uh right now I have a letters, I have a vacuum, I have uh, uh chairs, I have uh um umbrellas, uh stuff from pool. Like swimming pool, kids stuff, bicycles, tables. It's a mix. Boxes from the basement. Thank you. You're welcome. So people are turning shipping containers into houses. What would prevent him from turning a shipping container into a shed? For instance, only the size. You know, that... Well, we could put a condition with no power. I mean, you haven't. No, no, I'm not. No, there's no power on it. We can put a condition on it. There's no plumbing or power. I kind of like the time limitation. I mean, is there a time limit? The time limitation, why? Because she's a time. Yeah. If you give me a couple of years, uh, that would be plenty so I can get to. Mm -hmm. I only own this house for three years, and who knows this house? You know that uh, the house was really in rough condition. Um, so I'm trying to get my, with the two kids going to school, 12, 15 years old, it's not cheap to, to have everything done at once. So would anyone like to make a motion to put a time limit on the, I would, sure. Put a time limit of for two years. That would be fine, right? Is that acceptable? Is there a second to that motion? Oh, can, can we do that there? as a condition? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. oh, oh all right. Sorry. Um, uh, are there any interest, uh, butters or interested parties in the audience? Ma'am, come forward, please. You could give your name and address to the secretary. Melissa Miller, uh, 43 Cul de Sac Way, Fort Smith, Rhode Island. Thanks. I'm across the street. <clears throat> I have full on view of it yes. from my front window. So, you know, I probably I posted something when it was moved in there. It's not the view of it um, per se. It's not when I saw it move in, it was like, you know, pretty quiet, nice street down there. So it was a little uh Unsettling. My concern more is, do we have a noise ordinance for 10 o'clock in the town of Portsmouth? I don't know. We have a noise ordinance. That is uh, the jurisdiction of the police department. Pardon? The, the noise ordinance is the jurisdiction of the police department. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So my, my, okay, this is my concern. I live down, I've been in my house for over 26 years. I've been on the cul-de-sac. My concern is just, it's a very dark cul-de-sac down there. We've had some trouble with one of my neighbors. So when I'm sitting there at 10 o'clock at night, if they're putting something in the shed, I have lights shining in my window, noise going on. So I'm just more concerned about the activity after that kind of noise ordinance thing going on later in the evening. You know, I understand it has a bit. I don't have a problem with it being there. It's more the safety issue of being at the end of the cul de sac. I'm on my own. I've got, you know, sometimes there's big cars going in there, or, you know, so that's more my concern than anything else. Um, uh, 
Did you say you're 43 or? I'm 43. Okay. I'm right across the street. I'm, I'm at the end of the couple of sack. Yeah. Yeah. What would your preference be in, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, to, to ease the problems that you're either seeing or anticipating? I'm, you know, I, it's, like I said, anything like late in the evening, you know, where there's, I'm, we had a very bad issue on our street. I have my neighbors shooting turkeys in my yard. Okay. You know, that was taken up with the police department. It's a little unnerving, you know, when you start hearing things pinging, you know, <laughs> in the middle of the night and there's maybe, you know, at 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, somebody's driving down with, you know, their headlights and stuff. So there wasn't, there was a boat in there. I know if you had a boat, somebody came, it was very late and it unnerved me a little bit. That's all. So that's my, con that's just my biggest concern. It's not the appearance of it, what it's being used for. It's really not hindering me in any way, shape, form. It's more the, you know, late night activity. I don't know if there's somebody putting something in there or there's somebody breaking into somebody or there's somebody it's very desolate farm area out there mm -hmm. you know at night so it's just that's my concern more than anything yeah so that's all I have to say okay thank okay. you thank you <laughs> So now let's go back. Oh, oh, or is there anyone online? Any butters or interested parties online? No, there is not. So, so, so it occurs to me that that uh, um, uh, the objection that the a butter brought up could be as a result of commercial activity taking place in a residential neighborhood. And and you know that may be something to consider. It's kind of helpful, isn't it? To lend something to add to commercial activity if that's where it's for. To invite it into the neighborhood. Correct. That's I sympathize with. Can we also wrap it then? Well, I just I mean, it's, it's like getting what you want from the door to the barn, you know. Tough time to see the animals in that yeah, yeah. That's where I thought perhaps a, a time limit on getting rid of the thing. Who calls them? That does look commercial. I would like to. Um, it's, just, it's a sticky. I just like to comment that home occupations are allowed in, in residential zones. Ah, so. And is painting considered a home occupation? Anything and you can you can have really anything. So home occupations is just that which. You basically run a business out of your home. It's a residential home that you have a business out of that you ah, work on. Okay. So they're allowed in all residential zones. Okay. As long as you don't have like any any signs that say you're a, a business. So mm -hmm. okay. Can we put a oh what can we put a limit say after nine o'clock it's not to be used without um... yeah, well, well, there's no power to it, and the noise the abutters could take this to the police, like they did, mm -hmm. like uh, the abutter did with the turkey shooters. <laughs> the turkey. That's that time of year. Yeah. yeah. So, if you'd like, we can circle back around to the uh, condition of removing the. Th so again, do we have a? Do I have a motion to okay. put a time limit on this? Yeah. It's a motion to put a time limit. Approve it with a time uh, limit. Of, oh, approve it with a time limit of two years. And I don't know if we can put a time limit on when it gets used as well. Well, who's going to sit there? Uh, Kevin, yeah. Kevin, Kevin can answer that. We put a time limit when it gets used. That's it. Who uses a shed after nine o'clock? Well, my, my my proposal would be to, to approve it for a period of two years and remove it okay. within two years. Do I have a second on that second. motion? Ms. Horwitz seconds it. 
And uh, if there aren't any more questions, we can vote with Mr. Lorenzo. I think we have one more who, who? condition. I'm sorry. Oh, did you go? Uh, that there not be any any type of plumbing or electricity mm -hmm. put into the. Uh, well, there's nothing right there, but if you decided you wanted to use it at night and have floodlights, it's easy to run electric lines to it. We'd have to have a, my, well, my desire would be that that would not be allowed with it. You know, you probably don't plan to do it. You may never do it, but I think it's a, a reasonable stipulation. I think it's a reasonable stipulation to put in. So, so, so this motion is to prohibit power or plumbing to be attached to the structure. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have a second? Second. 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 A question for Anthony. Who, who follows up on this in, in two years? Two years. Zero. You're in the hot seat. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so if there's nothing else, we'll vote with Mr. Lorenzo, Ms. Horwitz, Mr. Raposa, myself, and Dr. Donovan. With uh, Dr. Donovan voting first. Uh, I'm going to um, vote to approve this with the stipulations that we had uh, put in. Um, I don't want it to be a, uh, hopefully we work out things between neighbors in terms of not, you know, using things, you know, too late or anything of that nature. And it sounds like a separate neighbor is the one who caused, you know, some of the problems there. And uh, I haven't been there at night to really know, you know, what it's, uh, what it's like, but so far the appearance of it is pretty minimally invasive. Um, at least it's, it's become that way, and it looks like you've made effort to do that. Um, so I'm going to prove that we uh, allow the variance um, on the dimensional variance under Article Four, Section C Five A, uh, one. Uh, sorry, B. Very good, uh, Mr. Raposa. I. Uh, it's a tough one because these are kind of a unique uh, challenge these days with the zoning, but um, I'm going to approve it. I feel like you. Can use it and you know you do property nice and consider the neighbors and uh i think the two year timeline is uh, a good compromise for you to kind of get things in motion and uh yeah i, I approve Ms. hortz i vote to approve for reasons previously stated mr lorenzo yeah i vote to approve also but the two-year time limit is part of this approval right? yes sir yes. okay uh, I also vote to approve, uh, given that the the applicant um, uh, wants the the uh, the shipping container as a stopgap measure while he uh, gets his basement flooding problem squared away, and then within two years the structure will be gone. Uh, taking that into consideration, this is a this is the least amount the, the least relief necessary. And to deny would amount to more than a mere inconvenience. So we have a unanimous approval. You're approved, sir. And next on the agenda, <laughs> would you like to take a five minute break and then get back so that- uh, So that's it. <laughs> well, Mr. Lindo wants to talk no, about- but can we Keep going. Do you need a five minute? I, I do not. Okay. Thank you. Bye, bye, bye. All right. So as the uh as so this the this sheet is um what I kind of drafted up with the help of uh <clears throat> with the help of the Rhode Island housing. Um this is the modifications to this state law, which is going to take in effect January 1st, uh, 2024. That's widely, um, a lot of, almost every town is kind of scrambling to to get these under wraps. Um, and we're not, no exception. We're working with a consultant right now to first, the, uh, our, our first action item, working with the consultant, are these new modifications that we need to update to our zoning ordinance? And then following that is going to be a complete rehaul of our zoning ordinance um, that will take place. So this takes precedent. The, the, uh, this is like phase one and we already have approvals from uh, RI Housing. We got a grant from RI Housing to work with a consultant. And then after this 
after we get these changes done, we will uh, work with the same consultant to rehaul our zoning ordinance. And that will probably help encompass all of 2024 and probably into 2025, just because of the nature of changing a lot of stuff in the zoning ordinance, which desperately needs to be changed and updated because it hasn't been updated in a long time. So we'll get to that later. So first I'll go over the uh, the modifications, which is pertains to you guys the most. So the, the way the package laid out is the modifications to the state zoning enabling act. And then just for your edification, there are um, after that are just the different changes. Like um, I included adaptive reuse, which is interesting just because it's, it's uh, it pertains to the town in general, not really the zoning board, but the town in general and all towns in, in the state. And then we have comprehensive plan implementation, um, but I'm not gonna bog you down. That's just for extra reading if you wanna do it. So to just get right into it, the um, what the bill does that was passed this year was it amends the provisions of the Zoning Enabling Act uh, from 1991 related to variance, special use permits, Modifications, notice provisions, standard, standard, substandard, lots of records, uh, and lot merger. So the um, the amendments for, to the standards it elim eliminates the requirements that the the hardship does not primarily result from the applicant's desire to realize greater financial gain. So you can no longer take that into consideration, and you can no longer take into consideration that it's the least relief necessary. Which, I mean. We use the least relief, you know, the board uses the least relief necessary often, um, and you can't take that into consideration anymore. So uh, I broke I broke down the uh, the new standards under underneath that. So it's basically everything else except the financial gain and the least relief necessary clause. You still have, uh, you know, you still have in accordance with the definition of variance and um, will not alter the general characteristic of the surrounding area. Uh, and it results in no prior result, prior action of the applicant. Uh, and the clarification, the, um, the relief saw is minimal to a reasonable enjoyment of the permitted use to which the property is proposed to be devoted. You can interpret that however you like. It's not my, you know, I, I still don't know how to interpret that, but you know, interpret that as you will. Um, moving on, uh, require you know, we have already have this provision requires municipalities to allow the granting of a special use permit in conjunction of dimensional variance, which we have. Um, same with the next one. Um, basically, that says if there's a if there's a, a special use permit listed in the that's not if, if somebody's asking for a special use permit not listed in the use table then we can go with the next closest thing resembling that so um we've had that before and it's just not in the it's not in the use table we don't account for every use out of the sun uh, but anything closest to that we'll lump it in with that uh, which is already standard practice that we do here it automatically goes to the zoning board if if it's not directly in the uh, in Article Five. Uh, the next one requires the zoning ordinances to provide for a specific and objective criteria for the issuance of each use category of special use permit. Uh, this one's kind of a big one. The, um, and it's because, so it's basically we have to have a clear and objective criteria. Um, if we don't have such criteria, then the use is considered to be a permitted use. So it goes from, if we don't have that, it goes from S to just permitted, yes. Um, and I have a chat attached after the last page of this. It's basically a template 
So the attached uh, special use permit template from Rhode Island Housing, you can see how in depth it gets for all the specific uses. Um, for this is just a template that Rhode Island Housing has helped municipalities try to figure this out. Uh, you can see how the objective, how in depth the in objective criteria gets. So for like a drive-through facility, a uh, gas station, you have to have specific objective criteria for each one of these special use permits. So it's a, it's going to be an, a, a large addendum to the ordinance. Um, and if we don't have it, then it's basically, it's basically permitted. Um, so give us, can you give us an example of what you say if you're trying to get a gas station approved? So you'd have to go through, so you'd have to go through that next page. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. so if you keep going, you, you'll see the, the specific criteria. It has to, and this is, okay. obviously this is just an uh, example. Yeah. Thank we're, you. This is stuff we're working with the consultant to figure out um, to get this language. And that's what they're going to help us write because that's you know that's what we're paying them for and that's we got what we got the grant for because we're a department of two and this would encompass our whole life <laughs> um so does this mean january these new rules take effect yes january 1st and and if 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 we don't have um all these objective criteria then that matrix of permitted uses everything becomes okay in, until you start getting objective criteria. I'm going to get to that. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. okay. I think that was busy Christmas. Yeah, busy Christmas. I was thinking about food. So many uses in Article 5 are specified as S for special use permit. Um, it A lot of those uses will be changed to yes or no. Basically, how it makes sense. Um, how, we got, how we're going to come up with that. If it makes sense in that, in that uh, zoning district, then we're going to permit it if it does because it's hard to get objective criteria for every single little thing um for like for example mixed use mixed residential and commercial uses except home occupations in the commercial light industrial heavy industrial water district town center um it's currently as an s for special use permit i'm i'm going to advocate that we just change it to y because a mixed residential and commercial uses in those zones it it just makes sense to just permit them without having to go through a specific objective criteria. Um, and it's basically, we're gonna go with the, we're gonna talk it out with the consultant, which ones are gonna go no, and which ones are gonna go yes. Um, so it's not all of them. No, it's not like a blanket list. Like some weird lots like that have like light industrial onions, onions may grow. Right, right. So what, exactly. Um, so we're gonna go through every one of those. We have a lot of them. Um, so it's gonna, it's, we have to go through and we're gonna have a lot of meetings to, you know, figure this out. Uh, it's, we're, we're gonna do recommend, from the recommendation of the consultant and, and our own views as planners to, to figure that out. Why would they rezone the East Campus to do that? So that's the case. If there's, a, you say if there's a house on like a light investment a lot, you don't need there's an existing residential uh yeah we have a lot of those and we're not going to spot zone every single one of them we're not going to be like oh it has a house on it so we're going to rezone it yeah, yeah and that's not really what's covered in our we might be able to do that down the line but that's it has to everything in the ordinance has to match up with with um that specific yeah, it becomes not a formal use if they change zoning in your residence and commercial. Right. Well, I was just thinking there was like a years ago they put a residential house on like a light commercial, which you know what I mean, like on East right. Road. You just zone it as residential, and then right. So when the zoning changes, then that becomes a legal just in conforming. Yeah. Right. Right. Um. Yeah, so in another example, indoor rec entertainment and recreational facilities operated for business gain, um, housed indoors, sound installation in the commercial, light industrial, heavy industrial, water district towns, sensor zones. It currently is a special use permit. That should be a permitted use. It's kind of an indoor entertainment recreational facility. It kind of goes with commercial, maybe light industrial, something like that. So it just makes sense. And it's not in a residential zone. You don't really want to have a an indoor commercial 
uh, entity in a residential zone. So that could be a no under residential, but instead of a special use in getting all that criteria objective and we, we might as well just say yes. Yeah. Um, I think it sort of, uh, years ago, there was sort of a sentiment in the town that they, they wanted everything to come with the board. They wanted everything to be a special use permit rather than the land saying yes or no, yeah. uh, which is kind of burden to, to a lot of property. So that's yeah. just the way that's going to come. And that's why our ordinance has so many of these passes. Yeah. And so the state is basically putting our our feet to the fire and say yes or no or put the criteria out there. Um, and then so uh, you know other changes and use regulations are forthcoming. Like I said, we're going to work with the, pro uh, the project consultant to work through the ordinance to get those get those figured out. Um, the changes the state changes allow the town to choose whether or not to enforce specific uses allowed by special use permits because. We don't have objective and specific criteria for every single one yet. Um, we can just be like, do we want to enforce it? Don't we want to enforce it? We can still uh, say there's a special use permit that we don't have an objective criteria for. And we still, we want kind of a modicum of control over it. Uh, even though we don't have a specific, uh, control, uh, specific criteria for it, we can say, okay, we're going to enforce this one. And they have to come to the zoning board to present they could if it gets denied they could appeal it go to go to superior court and say well you don't have a specific objective criteria for it it kind of it kind of extends the timeline and and that's just it's not it hasn't been tested yet because it's a new law so nothing's been tested in superior court or anything um it's just something we can just a different strategy we can do we, but we don't have to automatically say it's approved, it's yes or no. It can still be a special use permit. It just, we kind of are under the risk of um, appeal, I guess, Kevin. We run the risk of appeal um, doing that that way, but we don't really have any other choice. Well, I'm hypothetical here, but I'd, I'd be uh, very wary of uh, telling people if the law says you got to have objective criteria and we have none and then say you got to go to the board for a special use permit um even though we have no criteria which means it's permitted by law i think that would put us in some kind of legal peril it also but it also allows us to approve with conditions um but not really if if if, if the law says if you don't have objective criteria then it's a yes i know but I mean, and say, could be, I mean, I don't know. We, we can talk about this in some other time. But yeah, anyway. yeah, I know. But it's something that we can we can try for now, at least, because we have no other, we're not going to, like, if they say it's a special use permit, we don't have a good criteria, and they want to put something in that's that's crazy, we're not going to be like, automatically, yes, without it's even going. to come up with, like, a blanket. Well, I think objective criteria for things. And, you know what I mean? I mean, it's, if we can't come up with, we don't come up with objective objective criteria, then, then it's permitted. Right. So it's not like the onus is on the town to come up with that objective criteria or concede that it's permitted. I right. Mean, we can say you haul people to, to pay the money and hire lawyers and in you know to come to the board for a special use permit when we have no objective criteria. I mean, we're taking case case by case. Case by case basis, yeah. It's it it does run us into a little bit of legal peril. Um that's good genius. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So we're, you know, we, we need to, this is why we have to get this started really quick and we need to get this passed. And as the objective criteria is determined, are they changeable or how, how would it be changed? Imagine at a time you're going to set something up like that and realize it's you it be used by use. More stringent or loose, it's, yeah, it's, it's used by use by use. So, so everything so has its own objective. One size specific objective. At all. But, but I mean, if you have, if, if, if if an objective criteria was established for gas stations, and then a, a year from now we decide, well, you know, we'd like to tweak the objective criteria for gas stations. It, is that just something that's done administratively? And then it, you know, it's 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 from that point forward. There's you didn't amend the you have to, to amend the ordinance. You have to amend the ordinance, which is it's a it's a pain. It has to go through public comment. Has to go through, has to go through the three readings of uh, town council. Town council has to approve the language, um, 
anything that we tweak. So it, it it's a process like everything else. Um, it's a, just a, a process to go through and it has to, so if you want to tweak it, if you really, really, really want to tweak something, we can, um, but it just takes time. But, but, but if something was in the table as a yes, and then you wanted to apply an objective criteria, it would be that same process. You'd have to go through and amend the order. The objective criteria are for special use permits. Yeah. Just for a special, so if it's a yes, then it doesn't need any, it has no criteria. At yes, all. it doesn't go, oh, it doesn't oh, come oh. here. Okay, then, then if it's the other way around, if it's no, and then. If it's no, then it's not allowed at all. Then it's a use variance. If it's an S, then it has to have that special criteria. Okay. But I'm thinking if, if 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 you if something is not an S, and downstream we want it to be an S, mm -hmm. then that's the process of that's amendment. Not, that's not you. That's the legislative body, the town council. Yeah, yeah, the town council has yeah. to do the three readings and all that. Stuff. We not have three readings, but three ads in the paper. Three ads in the paper. Yeah, three ads. Three. Yeah. 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 So there is a mechanism to get more special use permit more S's in the future if if the town thinks that's a good idea. Yes. But I think the the idea, the notion here is that maybe we have too many S's. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not, exactly. Not, it not, is not that's, that we need more. That's pretty much it. And that's why we need to get rid of some of them and just okay. whatever makes sense, we're gonna approve or whatever doesn't make sense, we're just gonna say, no, you can't do it. Oh. And then that's a use variance and that use variances are very, very hard to prove. Um, but also, this uh because of we're kind of allowed to choose what we can and cannot enforce uh i'm no longer going to be enforcing enlargement of a structure on a substandard lot because it's always approved by this board um and it's you know if you're just going up that's an enlargement of a structure if you're within the height variance then it doesn't really make sense for it to go to a full board like it's a so I'm not going to enforce the enlargement of a structure because Island Park, Common Sense Point, you have to each sneeze and you, you have to go to the, get a special use permit. So yeah. it uh it makes it easier, especially if you just just have a special use permit for the enlargement of a structure on a self generated lot. I don't think it needs to be elevated to go to the board because pretty much every single one we've had, you've you've approved. Yeah. So um and we're gonna eliminate that officially in the zoning re revisions in 2025 anyway. Uh, the next one, and this is pretty interesting, uh, requires municipalities to provide the, for the issuance of dimensional modifications, which was previously optional and amend standards for granting dimensional modifications. Um, you can read those, I'm gonna give you the breakdown. Uh, they, well, basically, dimensional modifications up to 15% of the dimensional requirement must be allowed, and modifications between 15 and 25% may be allowed. Modifications of less than 5% of the dimensional requirement may be granted without notice. So I can administratively grant it. Um, changes the notice requirements, and that's that's on me. And reduces the public comment period to 13 to 30 to 15. 30 to 14 days. So the breakdown is uh, basically dimensional modifications up to five, so above five, up to 15 will be granted administratively with notice to abutters. Uh, so I would just notify abutters. Uh, an example of the 15% modification be like a homeowner on a lot in an R20 district wants to build an addition that encroaches two feet and three inches into the 15 foot side setback. The two foot three inch encroachment is 15%, which would be administratively approved with notice to abutters. There is no, if there is no objection within 14 days, the variance get, gets approved. If there are objections, the application will be heard before the board. Um, and the next one is the town may grant dimensional modifications of up to 25% administratively if the town chooses with notice to abutters. So basically what that means is we have to choose if we want to do the 15%, maybe 20%, maybe 25 of uh, dimensional relief. What, you know, we have to determine which one we, we want to go with, how, how much goes to the board or doesn't go to the board. Um, and I gave an example of that. So it's instead of homeowner on a lot, instead of the two foot, three inch, a 25% encroachment would be three foot, nine inch into the 15 yards side setback. Uh, which would be administratively approved with notice to abutters. 
Same thing, if there are no objections within 14 days, it's approved, there are, comes to the board. Um, I mean, it's not that big of a percentage, so it's really, it's up to the town council what we wanna go with, 15% or 25. Uh, if you have any input, that'd be great too. Um, and then dementia modifications of less than 5% of the requirement will be administratively approved without notice to abutters. So if somebody comes in and they have a really minor thing that is just, just over, but I, I can just sign off and say, yes, you're approved um, administratively without doing anything. Um, and I gave an example uh, in an R20 district, somebody wants to build an addition that encroaches one foot, five inch into the 30 foot front setback. One foot, five inch encroachment is 4.7, approximately 4.7%. And I can just say, yep, yeah, you're administratively approved. Good. Um, so that's kind of different. Uh, there's a lot of calculation I have to do. The next one is requiring substandard lots to have of record to have proportionally reduced dimensional standards that are equivalent to the proportion of the lot of a substandard lot to the minimum lot area requirements for the district in which it is located. This is going to take place. This is going to weigh in heavily on Island Park Common Fence Point area. I would I would say uh, a lot. They're gonna there's going to be a lot of change here. So. You could see the uh, the breakdown, the the mathematical equation, dimensional requirements for a substandard lot of record, the square footage of the parcel multiplied by the dimensional requirements for the zone divided by the zoning district required square footage. Um, we're going to round down in those. It's going to be a decimal almost all the time. So you're going to round down to the nearest whole number. So, for example, uh, the dimensional requirements for a lot in the R10 zone, which we have a lot of. Um, are 20 foot front, 20 foot rear, 10 foot side setback. A homeowner who is on a 6,098.4 square foot lot in the R10 zone will have the proportionally reduced dimensional standards of 12 feet front, 12 feet rear, and six foot side setback. So if they're within those dimensions, they're not gonna have to go to the board at all. They're just gonna be, boom, approved. Um, that's gonna take a lot, of, uh, a lot of work out of the zoning board especially in the common fence point island park parcels uh, because as you know like i said you, you just sneeze you have to go to the zoning board so that's going to take a lot um it's provision is in line with the 20 percent the maximum percent lot coverage you know you have reduced square footage of lot coverage when you have a a reduced square foot lot so a 6,098 square foot lot has 1,219.6 square feet to work with, as opposed to 10,000 square feet has 2,000. Proportional makes it in line with that. So, but that's so it's going to work for you, right? Well, yeah, I just have to do some. I just have to do some calculations to be like, <laughs> yeah. oh, you're within the dimensional proportion of that lot, so you can you can just do that with it right there. They don't have to be no longer that they have to are they strict 20 foot. Front twenty foot rear. I know he's going to need a new calculator. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the lot coverage hasn't changed. The, the no, mode. no, the lot, it's, it's still dimensional. Lot coverage percent is dimensionally proportional. Um, yeah. It is changing, that's it, right? Yeah. Because, uh, but that's how it was. Spot, like that example there. Is it the, the, the setbacks, definitely, but yeah. lot coverage was always 20% of what your and that's lot size oh, right. was. Right, and that's oh. proportional to the lot, yeah. too. So yes, that's, it's, yes. It, that, that's, what the, the lot, it, that's what the law is kind of taking into account. It's the proportion of the lot. It, it's taking that into account. So you have an 8,000 square foot lot. It's got to be a little bigger. So it's directly in proportion to the the square footage of the lot in line with the maximum percent lot coverage. Now it's just going to be applied to the setbacks mm -hmm. as opposed to just the lot itself. Sort of, yeah. a, oh, oh, sort of an off topic question yeah. is, is I've always been confused on lot coverage on does a driveway constitute lot coverage? Does a driveway made out of porous material lot, versus uh, driveways are exempt. Okay. Except in parking lots. Except in commercial. commercial. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Decks. Decks, yes. Decks count? Yes. Yes. Okay. Favors. Permeable favors. That's a mini permeable. 
Right. If, well, I mean, if it's a, if it's a, not in context, it it's really um if it's you know that's if you have a paper that's part of part of the landscaping, then no. It's not on the slab. As soon as you pour a slab, then yeah. it's not permanent. It was like a it's yeah. concrete. Right, right. If it's concrete, if it's paper. So patio style lot coverage. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So 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 Depends for example, patio. So for example, I have a deck that's Maybe made patio. out of. Hmm? I have a deck that's made out of wood. Yep. And it's raised. Lot coverage. Lot of coverage. Okay. So Even though there's dirt underneath it and the water yeah. gets down there. But a paper, okay. but a paper was a bunch of pavers. So much of you guys. You know, sound gravel. That's not lot coverage. Right. So like a pool is it's not lot coverage. Just right. the pool. The pool is. But yeah. the but the around it. Correct. But if you raise the pool. If we had a situation well, uh -huh. in Newport where it was that's raised, not, that's not, then it's lot you, covered. If you raise the elevation of your property and you retain the earth, is that considered lot covered? Because it is a Newport. If you retain the earth, if you retain the earth from grade, if you retain the grade, like say you land slope like this, and they're saying, I've heard of a case where they put a retaining wall and then they level the yard out. It's not that, lot coverage. We're going to go for the, the, the square for, footage for of like the a patio or something. Yeah, but if you raise a patio and you have steps up to the patio, then it's included. My understanding is it gets included in lot coverage if it's raised. So we had a situation not in Portsmouth, but where they, there was a rock. There was rock. So they raised their swimming pool and they raised the surround of the and that whole area was included in lot coverage because it was raised. Makes sense. And then the eaves. Eaves, 18 inches. Is not included in not lot in, coverage. Yeah, it's in our ordinance that 18 inches is not included. Anything over that is included. So if you go over 19 inches, that's included. Is 19 inches included or just the one inch? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. A reasonable question. That is a reasonable question. That's something I've had to determine. <laughs> Probably less than 18 inches, right? Otherwise, you. But when, how often do you do eaves more than 18? I mean, 12 inches. No, but it's objective. Yeah, it's really just a game of twice. <laughs> your end kind of question. That, so like, that'd be open to interpretation, really, if it was one inch or the whole 19 inches. So that would change significantly. I'm just going to do this. Or... So this is for the whole of Rhode Island. Yes. Okay. As of January, any January applicant, 1st. any job we're working on starting January the 1st, we can say to the town, we don't need a variance because of X, Y, and Z. If it falls under this criteria. Yeah. 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 Oh, oh, man, you guys are- Man, yeah. this is big. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's it completely is. flipping over the, the zoning. Well, zoning I mean, gutter on you. <laughs> <laughs> don't they usually go underneath? <laughs> Not a great thing. Do that after you have the occupancy permit, okay. Are we doing anything with auxiliary dwelling units? Not yet. Okay. We're we're, we're following state law and that's a very contentious issue. Oh, okay. Um because it's interpreted different ways throughout the state. We interpret it differently. Mm -hmm. How are you gonna document this, Sharon? How hmm? is this gonna get documented? What do you mean? The zoning it's gonna be documented in the, the zoning ordinance. Yeah. Or? It's gonna we're gonna and you're gonna do that in January first. Uh, no, <laughs> we're okay. We're trying to we're trying the best we can. We retained a consultant. We've got a grant oh. to, for a hundred thousand dollars to make these changes immediately, as okay. soon as possible. Some things are just black and white. It's, 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 it's the new state law says you got to do this. And yeah, and the artist sort of implied that you something. Okay. Well, this is going to put me way ahead of other designers because I have this inside information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not inside information, it's public knowledge. You just, you're just getting, you're just learning about it. Yeah, but this <laughs> means January we're going to be working under new rules. Yes. But but we may not have all this. You may not have all this stuff figured out. Uh huh. So yeah. so you're going to really have to help us understand that that well, you know. I already have a direct talk with. with they want it's an always the case. If there's something in conflict with the provision of the Zoning Enabling Act, then that supersedes. That we wouldn't we wouldn't enforce it. Exactly. I'm already I'm already selling applicants that fall under this new provision come back in January because you get the paper. 
There's no reason. There's no reason. Pool, well, pool fences. We've we've decided to not enforce the six foot rule because state building code is four foot fence, or if you have a or if you have a protective covering that you can walk on, you don't even need a fence. Then no. we're going to go by state law with that. So a lot of changes, and we're we're just you know. We're working with it. So January is going to be fun. Oh yeah, totally, totally fun. But there's, I mean, I have a lot of, I have like three or four applications that are going to come in that I can just administratively, administratively approve. Yeah. Yeah. I was. I was looking up to you, Cousin. You know, I was going to happen. Yeah. Do you need more? Do you need a fence? Less full cover. Yeah. You need a fence? Do you have a pool cover? A hard, a hard pool cover. Like really? one something you can walk on that you have. But, but what if you don't put it on? Uh, you have to make sure the onus is. So it has to be inspected to make sure it works. If you don't put it on, that's negligence on your part. Okay, that's it, like it, having it, the it, gate it, open. Well, I have one, but I don't shut it all the time. It's hot. Okay, well, that's. So you're saying, like, for me, uh, like I would never want to not have a fence. I would want to find something in the pool. I guess that's how we're going to. Well, you take the. We'll cover off. No, we'll violation. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, can no. you walk on it? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know kids, but yeah. Yeah. If you can, so you can walk. If it's a safety <laughs> one, if it's an approved one, if you don't roll it up, that's on you. I just can't believe that like all this time we had to have a six foot fence and now if you have the cover, but you don't need it. Like that's we had that huge thing and called Chappelle was the, the red the lawyer for it. Yes, but it's not it like was, it's done. Sure. There's a conflict between the building code and the zoning code. Correct. And in that yeah. case, the zoning code won. They didn't. The board didn't approve. Yeah. yeah. The board has kind of had a different uh, shift in mentality. It used to be the board and the board made a big thing about the six foot fence, and, and it's it's not entirely crystal clear. But I mean, there's been arguments that building code supersedes and the town can't have a six foot fence. I think there's a reasonable argument that 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 was the monitor that town, well, as a matter of zoning, town can have a six foot enclosure requirement. But you kind of just kind of threw in the towel when, when there was been a couple of petitions where the board has said, well, it sort of conceded the whole thing. So now I think the position. Because they can, they can appeal that decision and say it's allowed by the state. They can make yeah. the decision and then. But I mean, arguably, it, arguably, the, the zoning. The town is a, a matter of zoning can have a it's tough enclosure, you know. So, but I think we're conceding that at this point because there's, there's a reasonable argument that the, that there shouldn't be, and then everyone seems to concede now that they're going to change that. So, so why burden the, the property, property owner? Why burden? Oh, well, it, it would be. It would I don't agree with your opinion, but it should be aligned with the state, I guess. And if, if somebody challenged it, that'd be just more work for you. <laughs> So, Aaron, what happens if, if you have a project come before us where the setbacks can be approved administratively, but the lot coverage can't be? Do you come to the board with both then still, or do you then we you're only coming to the board for the lot coverage? It's just lot coverage because if it's if it's just if it's direct uh, proportional to the lot itself, like in that example, a twelve foot, twelve foot, six foot. If they're within that, I'm not going to have the board. I'm so, not but then you're having to do two applications, really. An application to you to get you to approve. No, that's not. No. It, it's, so it's not an application. It's just. You're automatically approved. If you have, if you're within your, if you're within your dimensional direct, uh, dimensional proportion, proportions for the lot, then it's automatically approved. I'm not going to okay. have them. Okay. I'm not going right. to have them ask for a dimensional relief for something they don't need one for. Because it's, yeah. That's what it is. Very cool. So how does this get conveyed to the building inspector? Hmm? How how does this all get conveyed to the building inspector? The building inspector. I work very closely with the building inspector. Um, so he comes to me and gives says, "Hey, just sort of like I have in the building permit section." So I you have, have sign off on that. Yeah. Okay. Basically, I have a, a task saying goes to me. If I approve it, I'll say completed. Then he issues the building permit. Um, that's how it works right now. So I, I I'm tasked with reviewing these plans, and it goes yeah. to the building plan. Question, sir. Yeah. Mechanical equipment. 
mounted to the side of the house or, or mechanical tools in general? Is that including lot coverage? And does it need a variance if it's within the setbacks? Or um, no risk yet. I do. <laughs> I have a, a difference in interpretation um, than one of the board members, not here. <laughs> And he would say otherwise. I think if it's a pad, if it's a concrete pad, then yeah, like a, a mechanical equipment on a concrete pad, because it's on the on a concrete pad, then it's considered lot coverage. And uh, if it's mounted on the exterior, it's mounted on the exterior. So how about a generator? Is included? If it's, on a, if it's on a if it's on a concrete pad, that's supposed to be ten feet from the car. That's a building code issue. That's a mechanical code issue. So if it's like a condenser, is not. Um. You know. Yeah. And then what about pool equipment? Pool equipment in a shed, like, like on a concrete pad. You can do that. Consideration is being a good neighbor, right? You're gonna take all your stuff and stick it next to behind your house, right next to your neighbor's house. Well, if you have like a a, a uh, hundred twenty square foot shed and you put it three feet off the property line, put all your pool equipment in there, which is behind the house, behind the house, which next to it. Which I'm, I'm not gonna go into what changes I'm. I'm trying to make with the zoning ordinance, but um, like behind the house or, you know, specifically behind the house, because you have certain houses that are situated where you can't have a shed behind the house. Um, okay, what about pergolas that have concrete footings for the posts? No. 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 Interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Barrington because, includes because pergolas. You could easily convert that into, I guess it's not really a boot, but a boot trap. You can yeah. make it a boot trap. You can... yeah. Does it have four open open sides? Oh, well, I'm thinking like one that was off or three open sides. Yeah, three. It may have two because you've got an L shaped but house. So it's down, so. but, it, but that's a permanent fixture. Do you have, is it, is it a patio underneath? Yes. So, yeah, if it's a patio. So, if there's a patio and it's got piers, then it's like a no. It's like a, well, it, if it's a patio, then I would it's say not, but if it's not, if it's covered by a fixed structure, then it's taken, you know, like it's 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 part of the earth because it's somebody dug down 44 inches because they didn't want to see the sea. So it's it's, it's got full thick, right? full footings, but mm -hmm. the patio can still be permeable above its fixed. So, mm -hmm. so above its fixed to the building, I'm, I'm taking ones that are like tied. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand that. Above it's fixed to the building, right? So, but the, but the pavers or individual pavers just sitting on. Well, permeable, because it's well, not, they're not on the slab. I mean, they're just, but they're, they're just not. not they, how can they be permeable? Well, the permeable, they have them, they're just. They, they've they got the sand joints, joints, joints. I don't know. I don't think they're but as it, permeable as my deck. Well, yeah, that's I think, what I was thinking. Yeah, technically, my deck is, is pretty darn permeable, but. But you know, I just want to know what the rule well, is. Well, it's like a deck, right? The <laughs> permeable is kind of like a deck. It's fixed. You can't walk. Sure. It's got members this way. It's got members this way. It's the same exact thing as the deck. It's got piers to the ground. So would cross. you include, did you say you would include a, a pergola in the... I haven't come across a pergola for, for like lots I'm going to bring it to you soon. Okay. <laughs> then I'll have to, I'll have to make... Case, it. case. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, no, I, then I have to make a determination. No, it's interesting because Barrington includes it and I've never been in any other town where a pergola is included. Middletown doesn't. Right. And Newport doesn't. I mean, it's inter It's just basically down to the interpretation of... I bet you they had a case where someone turned it into like a roof and then all of a sudden they said, oh no, now it's... Is a pergola... Like you know what I mean? They had somebody changed what, stuff in that one. Yeah. on top. Oh, okay. yeah. but, well, I would say a roof on top, yes. That is different. But, yeah, but, but a pergola still, even the members fixed, you, it's essentially a roof. You have the canvas slides on it, you know. But it's not waterproof, even if you do the mouth. You have a I mean you, you do have a no. you have a point there. You walk under the thing, the deck will Okay, we don't want the pergolas in the okay. has the mechanical one where you can't be in the in the setbacks. Yeah, I, I mean I came from East Branch and they didn't have mechanical as the trumps. So no, it's Every every no, town is different. Think, that, you know, yeah. down into inter into to, down to interpretation. Um, interesting. Uh, interesting stuff. Very interesting. Uh, 
going on. The, the, we don't have a merger provision, good, so the next one doesn't is not relevant. And the uh, alteration of non-conforming development, and we already have that by special use permit. So, and that's the gist of the changes by going on. Um, I did include all the changes that are occurring that you might be interested in, like uh, adaptive reuse is pretty cool. Shipping containers will will be addressed in the in the rehaul, <laughs> overhaul, I should say. So we have adaptive reuse, which is kind of cool. Um, that has to do with uh, land development. A lot of things for so for like uh, land development. They're not, they're no, it's no longer going to go to planning board, zoning board, planning board. It's now just got to go just to planning board. So anything like land development that needs, uh, that needs zoning relief, it's just going to go to the zoning, uh, the planning board. It won't come to you. Cool. They're going to have jurisdiction. Kind of like what a comp plan is. They have comp plan is one stop shop. It's kind of making all zoning relief from land development. So if you have like a subdivision that has two houses, you need zoning relief for, whatever reason, it's not going to come to you. It's universally going to the planning board, cutting it out. So, um, comprehensive plan, implementation. So I mean, I mean, I had to develop the maybe and then get to the thing like saying, just go to the property owner and develop it. Yeah, you can buy the sense, but what happens if you have a brand new development that has a uniform development that you uh, yep. instead of going to the planning board and saying, well, you need a variance and conditionally approve it, then you go to the zoning board to get the next variance and then go back to the planning board. Well, I mean, what if, yeah. what if you get a subdivision approved and those, those dimensional, um, the dimension, the setbacks are part of the subdivision? Yeah, that means a guy can turn around and go go in for a building permit and reduce those setbacks, right? No, the planning board will grant those grant the relief, not the zoning board. So the, the planning board now will have the authority to grant the dimensional relief required in a land development or a subdivision. So well, what if they what if they don't and someone buys it? Then they won't approve and it. And then they can they won't approve the subdivision if they're not going to approve it. No, I'm saying that the subdivision is all approved with these dimensions that meet the existing zoning criteria, whatever it is, for our 20, our 40. Yeah. And now I'm going in for a building permit. I can apply this? No, you'd have to go through. You, you, so the way a land development works and a subdivision works, you have a decision with, um, you have written decision and you have to, with with conditions. So you have to, they'll, they'll implement that in the, the conditions that it has to go okay. with. That's what I'm asking. But the, right. the planning board has to adhere to, you know, they have to, we're not going to create a, a substandard lot, first of all. So these, this dimensional yeah, proportion okay. to a substandard lot wouldn't really apply anywhere. We're not going to, unless they're, the, the planning board approves a substandard lot for which they have in a, in a, uh, the, but it's part of that decision, part of the uh, criteria where they review yeah, it yeah. if they see it's apt. They're allowed to do that, but they're not going to come to the get a building permit and say, "Oh, it's already going to be out there. It's going to be in out in public that they're going to allow the dimensions of the lot to be this." Does that make sense? Yeah, you can't come by in ten years from now with a build with a lot and apply this. No, because you'll have the decision to go by and be like, right. "Oh, this is what we what we approved or what we voted on." Yeah. It's going to be part of the public record, recorded in the town clerk's office, and. This is just designed for all those crazy non-conforming lots we have. Right? Yes, which we have a lot of. Um, yeah, dimensional modifications, LMI housing was neat. Um, and then other stuff, inclusionary zoning. We don't have inclusionary zoning now, but we're going to. So inclusionary zoning meaning you have to have a minimum amount of low mod income houses. Um, from where I came from, my old job, we had 20% as a minimum. Every subdivision had 20% uh, in 20 low mod. So for every one, for every five market rate, you have one low mod. Usually it's 120%, so it's not really affordable housing, but it's deed restricted to a certain amount. We don't have that, but we're trying to implement that in the future. 
Uh, hmm? uh, optional, yeah, but it's a net good thing, I think, for oh, increasing okay. housing stock. Yeah, that, that blue thing, you wear that thing two weeks ago. Yeah. And to get one of the people on it, there was some issues specific for that. Well, well the, the, we have a mandate of 10% of our housing stock being affordable housing. We're at 2%. Um, this doesn't really help because the more market rate units go online, the higher the, uh, you know, it's just a moving target that we're never going to reach. No, like if you haven't reached it yet, you're not going to really reach it unless you have like a a uh, industrial uh, complex where you you uh you put all affordable units in that like a comp permit where all of them are affordable then you're not increasing the market rate units so you're increasing you're getting to that ten percent. I agree. And that should be changed. And that's, I was asking for the guest here today, but I just said because the sunny and the other places like that are affordable housing. You might not get the type you want, but it's affordable housing. Yeah. And for some reason, Middletown, Oxbow Farm, is not considered affordable housing. Yeah, that doesn't make sense at all to me. The article for the people to see if they want to get time from the guest. Yeah, you have to have a deed restricted too. That's that's part of the requirement. You have to have it uh, a deed restricted affordable house. So you, you have to go to a monitoring agent, and they have to set the deed restriction, and they have to be a, a prospective buyer has to be approved for that. Um, so it's you, know, you have to go through the motions of it. But yeah, the, it's a the comp permit comprehensive plan act. I forget what it's called. It was set up to be a, a builder's um, a builder's law. Basically, they when the um, they wanted to keep building happen, so they implemented this one stop shopping to get builders to build more. And so now we have this law that people can build one stop shop to planning board and it's really, really hard to appeal. And it usually is an appeal. So. so there you have it. That's the uh, thank you. Very interesting. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Nice job, Brian. Can I have a motion to adjourn? Second. So I've made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. I almost said for reasons previously stated.